I'm Luke Thomas, Design Director at uh, John Cullen, and uh, I'll be running the uh, webinar this morning with my esteemed colleague, uh, Matt Healy, our Product Development Manager, um, joining for the call today. He's very, very much a technical expert in the field of lighting, so it's great to have him on board this morning. So good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to this morning's uh, Light Bites episode. Um, and today we'll be looking at uh, selecting the right LEDs um, and, and why that's important. So uh, why are we looking at selecting the right LEDs? Um, well, so far we've been looking at you know, how to create the best lighting plans. Uh, I've given you some, uh, some tips uh, which you can use um, to intelligently apply lighting to spaces to enhance it. But without the right uh, product, um, without the, the, the correctly specified uh, luminaire, you're not going to be able to achieve uh, the effects that you want to create anyway. Uh, and also, if you have the best product in the world, you're not necessarily going to be able to get the best effect from it unless you know how to use it. So the two go hand in hand. Uh, and that's why we thought that today's episode would be uh, a really important one to look at. Uh, I'm going to hand over to, to Matt, who's actually going to lead the presentation today. I'm going to be monitoring the Q&A. Um, so if you want to post any questions on there, I'll pick them up um, and I'll post them to, to Matt uh, or post them to Matt as and when uh, appropriate as we go through the presentation. Um, and if there's any left over, then we'll address those at the, at the end of today. Uh, so over to you, Matt. Cool, thanks Luke and good, uh, good morning everyone. Uh, thanks Luke for letting me out of my uh, R&D cave to come and speak to you all this morning. Uh, <laughs> I don't get out much and this is, this is lots of fun. So what we're gonna run through today is kind of an overview of, of our product and product in general, just going into uh, the sort of fundamentals of, of a luminaire and, and what you guys should be looking out for um, and some, some sort of tips on, on how we view what luminaire should be selected. And then a, a bit of a, for want of a better phrase, like a jargon bust at the end, just to coming, just talking through some of the uh, terminology that you might have heard before, but maybe um, are, are unsure about or or what's the best uh, version of that you should be using. So um, as I say, uh, Luke will monitor the questions, which we'll bring at the end. Um, hopefully nothing too tricky because it is Monday morning, but I'll, I'll do my best. Um, so kind of the anatomy of the luminaire, and hopefully this will, this will work. Um, it seems to have, if Luke can nod at me, that that's worked okay. Brilliant, fantastic. So, um, what we're looking at there is kind of sort of the main elements and what we've used here is one of our Borsa spotlights. Um, and we'll cover all of these in a bit of detail as we go through. So um, if I start from sort of left to right, so especially with what we do, we try and incorporate our adjustability and flexibility within our design in, in as, as discreet a way as possible. What we like to do is to, is, is to give you guys some options in how you lose a luminaire, so where we can introduce a tilt or a rotation function, we will. Um, we thermally manage our product through the design of the body itself, which I'll cover later on. And then there's sort of the part that everyone maybe will have heard about, but don't really understand how it works, which is the LED. And that's kind of the, the heart of the product. And it's where we start when we, we design a product, we, we pick the right LED for that right application and build everything else around it, uh, including the optic. Um, this gives us the control of the light, and sort of gives the functionality to the, the designers to, to give the effect they need. Um, but sometimes you need some extra bits and pieces like the lens accessories and honeycombs um, to give that extra bit of control. Often with the John Cullen product, you'll see uh, a sort of a black baffle snoot design, which gives us uh, the glare control so we can Give you the light where you need it but also we don't want to give any any unnecessary headaches or anything like that. Uh, in terms of what an LED is, I've got some examples on the right. Um, an LED is an electronic device, um, it creates heat and there, there's many types of them. What we, so the, the version you see top right is kind of your low low power one that you would see on front of an old, of an old telly. Um, the, the mid power is typically what you see Work, actually working in TVs, but also in terms of lighting on your LED strip lights. Um, the high power LED chip, that's what we use predominantly. Um, they tend to be anywhere between sort of one, two mil up to, to seven, eight millimeters in size uh, and illuminate enough power to uh, lead up light a residential 
property. We use these products over the cob because of the control we can get. So the smaller the light source, the, the more control we can get out of our optics. Um, the cob LED is something we started to play around with, uh, but mainly due to its size was, was used in sort of commercial applications. I don't really want to sort of read every bullet point I've wrote, but just to, to give you some background, uh, an LED is an electronic component. Uh, it tends to be more robust than a traditional light source, a lot smaller in size. And because of that, we can miniaturize our products and make them even more discreet. Um, in terms of what an LED is, apart from being an electronic component, it is a diode. Um, and actually the process of passing electricity through it gives us a, often a blue or a, a, sort, of, a sort of pinky light. We're, we, we're, enable, we're able to make that white by covering it in a yellow phosphor, which is why sometimes people comment on the sort of the egg yolk effect. But really what that yellow is doing is giving us that white light. Um, I say, I'm gonna, I'll breeze over this, but for any more specific questions we'll cover at the end. Matt, can I just stop you there? Can I um, just check everyone's sound is working okay this morning? If, if you can raise your hand for me, please, just to confirm you can hear us okay. There's a few people just saying it's a little bit quiet. Most people seem to not have an issue. So I think anyone having an issue, possibly it's on, on, on your end. Sorry to interrupt, Matt. Back to you. That's okay. It could be me mumbling, so I'll try not to, <laughs> to mumble as well. Um, again, not to cover in too much detail, but to give you guys some background on how we get to the, the LEDs we use. Uh, and LEDs actually, they kind of say it's grown. And often when I'll do presentations, I will talk about uh, a recipe or the method of being produced is kind of like cooking. So they grow this silicon wafer, which they slice down into the discs you see on the left. Then they're, they're then uh, themselves sliced down into the sort of mini squares you see. Uh, a phosphor is applied, so you, you have the chip that gives you the blue light. Uh, we then, and that even that photo even more sort of shows you to why people call it the egg yolk. So that layer of phosphor is put over the top and that gives you your, your white light. The LEDs are tested throughout the process to group them. And that's in terms of lumen output, color, color consistency, color rendition. So they call it binning and I guess the idea is, imagine a guy at the end of a line, uh, not literally, but grouping the product, throwing them into different bins, into different groups. Uh, our products are then uh, mounted, it's a second to last image on the right, uh, via a surface mount machine. And that gives us this uh, LED PCB at the end, which that particular version is about 15 millimeters in diameter. It's amazing the precision that goes into it. It's quite a science, isn't it? Yeah. Or in a laboratory rather than a, rather than in a workshop. Exactly. I have heard stories of guys building samples, having their iron turned upside down and mounting their LEDs on top of an iron. But obviously <laughs> we don't do that. Our, our PCBs are all mounted in the UK. So the chips themselves may come from far afield, but all the sort of sub-assembly and PCB mounting is done in the UK. Um, and actually it is a big difference because if those LEDs are slightly off, especially with a narrow optic, it can give you a really, really weird effect. So yeah, precision is key. And the PCB is a printed circuit board uh, for those yeah, of you who are not sure. So there's a question coming from uh, Jemima. Yeah. Right, thanks Matt. I, 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 no, don't worry. I, I speak in acronyms. So I have to <laughs> think about what I'm saying. Um, yeah, often aluminium or some other, uh, other materials that help with the heat transfer. Um, which is really important with LEDs, which we'll cover. Um, in terms of thermal design, so it's, it's a myth and it always comes up when I do presentations about LEDs don't produce heat and they do. Anything that passes electricity through it will produce heat. Um, the benefit of an LED is it's more efficient, but it still produces heat. So an LED, um, if you put roughly 10 watts of power into it, seven watts of that will be heat. Um, with older technology that it was a lot more inefficient, but we have to manage that heat somehow. So if you left an LED on its own, it would run over 250 degrees. We've measured, measured some up at 400 degrees, even the really small LEDs. So what we have to do is manage the heat so it operates at its optimum temperature, which is often 85 degrees. And that's in terms of giving you the lifetime that people talk about, your 25, 30, 50,000 hours that maintain the color, if they overheat, the color can shift over a very small amount of time and you're left with 
um, uh, colors uh, that don't match. Um, so it's really important to maintain the heat. And another, I, I'll probably get this call once every two weeks about someone worried that the heat's in their products is hot. And that's a good thing because it's doing its job. I'd be more worried if it was stone cold. 